I guess. Uh, I guess Joey can maybe if you want to talk about how it'll be run once I guess starting uh, once we hit forty. Yeah. Like it. Sick. Awesome. Okay, so it's now 940, so we can get started. Uh, just to reiterate, uh, feel free to turn your cameras on. And yeah, in case you uh, just, I guess, to introduce the topic of today, it'll be a workshop on using AWS and React and just more generally like React for backend engineers. And it's taught by Joey Bezgin, a friend of mine, and he's a software engineer at Facebook. And we were together in Cal Band last year. So I love Joey, and I'll hand that mic off to him to let him introduce himself. Thanks, Mark. Hey, everyone. Uh, my name is Joey. I just graduated from Cal last semester. I studied EECS and had a minor in mechanical engineering, and I now work as a software engineer at Facebook. I'm working on Instagram direct messages, building out um, their iOS side of things. So if you have any questions about that at the end, um, I'll be more than happy to kind of talk about my experience so far. Um, today, or as Samar said, I've worked with him, well, we were in the Cal Band together, and then we worked on a, like a React Native project this summer, um, as well as on a, a project called Resource 19 last semester. So we've kind of done a fair amount of um, work and um, like hanging out together. So I'm super excited to be here. Um, today, I'm probably, not probably, I am just going to go over mainly what AWS is, um, different ways that you can integrate AWS into a web application, uh, spe specifically a React application. And I'll cover kind of some of the resources that AWS provides to get you up and running. Um, so I believe some more shared a GitHub. I pushed some starter code earlier today, which is what I'm going to be starting from. And so if you want to kind of follow along with what we're doing, feel free to pull that starter code um and and build it and run it in your browser um but i'll also share my screen and go through all of the steps so <clears throat> without further ado here's my screen now what we're going to do today is essentially just from scratch start um, a react app and the app is just going to be something basic like this where it's a list of restaurants connected to a backend, and it enables you to uh, upload a restaurant name, description, city with a file, and it'll display that list from AWS. And so what we're using is something called uh, AWS's Amplify, and that is a JavaScript framework that easily integrates with React um, and with front-end code to allow you to uh, very simply, through a CLI, port and connect to certain AWS services. Um, and that allows you to connect to things like a database via, via DynamoDB. It allows you to connect to S3 buckets. Um, and it also allows you to pretty easily host the actual web application um, by writing custom build scripts um, and hosting it on their platform. Um, so if any of you have maybe used Google Firebase in the past, uh, this is a very similar feature that AWS has just called Amplify and, and built on, no, that's not the AWS Amplify. And built on AWS's platform. So that's what we're gonna be using today. Um, there's a lot of different ways that you can host a React app. And I know that uh, I think most of you might be on the back end track of WDB. So I'll try to touch that a little bit more, but just to highlight um, some other ways that you can host it. Uh, AWS also allows you to host static files um, for a statically, or a statically generated website in S3 buckets. And you can put a CloudFront distribution on top of that, which will manage all of the load balancing to distribute the website around to a lot of people. Um, so that's one way that you can host a website. You can port it via Amplify and use their CLI to actually get the website up and running and then put a custom uh, domain on top of that. Or you can also write your own express server or other um, backend server to inter interface with like a Node.js thing and uh, put that in a software called Elastic Beanstalk that AWS has that also allows you to um, render statically generated uh, websites or even dynamically generated websites where the server will um, dynamically respond to 
uh, what the user is um, asking. I won't get into those other types of uh, hosting in this workshop, but I just wanted to kind of start off addressing that. There's a lot of ways that you can host a website. And so that's one of the ways to do it. So uh, <clears throat> to start with Amplify, um, here's a React app. I've basically, I, I wrote the entire app and then I like stubbed out uh, the parts that we can fill in so I can explain kind of how React works as well as uh, what we're doing with Amplify. Um, I'm hoping that I can go through it pretty easily with no problems, but I also have uh, the finished product open in another port as well. So I can, I can talk through that. So basically what we've done so far is we've created a React app. And normally when you create a React app, like that loading screen on React would pop up that just says, this is a React app. Um, and we'll start from that screen. And so in order to initialize an Amplify project, you're gonna run Amplify in it. And as I said, this is like a CLI based um, tool. So all of the Amplify commands that you'll be running can be run from a terminal window, the command line. And so you'll just go through all of these set up uh, options to set, set up the Amplify environment. Uh, the default ones will work pretty well at this point. And then what it'll do on the back end is generate a connection with AWS services that you're going to want to use. And so we can use all of the default programs and wait for that to initialize. And while we're waiting for that, we can go to the Amazon console and I can show you what it's going to look like when we connect to it. So in the Amazon console, you can connect to all of their services via web interface. Um, one specifically is DynamoDB, which is their relational database. Um, sorry, their non-relational database. Um, and in here, if you have ones that are created, you can click on them, you can view the items in there and you can see kind of what's been uploaded so far. So you as a developer have a lot of um, things and ways to interact with the database via their CLI here, which is super nice. Um, some of their other services in here, Elastic Beanstalk I talked about, EC2 instances are basically virtual machines, but you can access all of those from the from the web interface. So now that we've had, um, now that we've set up this Amplify project, we're going to want to run, or we're gonna to wanna to add something to it. And the way that we add like an API is to connect to a DynamoDB instance is simply by running Amplify add API. Oops. And one of the things that's neat about Amplify is it works with both REST, uh, REST endpoints as well as GraphQL endpoints. And so I'll explain uh, what that is in a second as well. So we'll go through these uh, CLI options and it's gonna ask if we have an annotated GraphQL schema. Um, we'll say no, and this is going to allow us, it's gonna open up a file for us to define the schema. So what GraphQL is, it's actually something made by Facebook, which is cool. It's an open source kind of framework for um, sending information from like a server to a client or from a server to a server. And the way that it works is you define a schema file and you define exactly what's going to um, there it is So let me just, I thought I had it open up, but I did not. So I'm gonna do that. So here's a graph, well, that's opening, I'll just talk through here. So here's a GraphQL schema file. 
it's going to look like something where you're defining a model and you're going to list the specific points that are in the model. And so anytime that you make a request from a, a server to a client, um, it's going to be in the form of like kind of a JSON like object with these IDs. And so <clears throat> for our purpose, we're going to use this model for a restaurant. And so what we're saying here is the restaurant uh, type of object that we're sending from a server to the client that's stored in the database is going to contain a name field. And the name is going to be a string. The exclamation point means that the string is required. It's going to contain a description field, also a string, also required. And it's going to contain a city field, um, also a string, also required. And we can see that in the React app that I have finished here, that'll uh, correspond with the name description in city. And then uh, we can set up the, the image later. But so we'll use that gra GraphQL schema, um, save it. And now that's going to allow us to send that back to Amplify. And we're going to run that with Amplify push. Oops, I was in the wrong directory when I opened up Amplify. That's why this is not working. Sorry, friends, one second. We're gonna have to run these. CLI commands one more time just to get in the right directory. My apologies. There we go. We're going to run through the CLI one more time to set it up in the proper terminal. All right, well, that's loading. I'm gonna go over here and talk through that that I already have open. There we go. Life coding is kind of hard. Okay, so once we initialize the Amplify project, it's going to add this folder called Amplify uh, with all of our customizations that we just added um, in here. And so we can see in the API, we'll have this schema GraphQL schema that corresponds to um, what we want. And so what we're saying is we're going to make a restaurant model and it's going to have a name, it's going to have a description that's required, and it's going to have a city that's also required. And when we set that up, we can run Amplify push and that'll push it to the cloud to generate uh, the connections to the DynamoDB instances that I was talking about earlier. I apologize, that took a while to get to. Um, and so while that's loading, 
what this is going to do is it's going to auto generate a table uh, for us here in DynamoDB. And it's going to generate a bunch of nice JavaScript code that we can use to interact with the objects that we have hosted in our DynamoDB. And that makes it very easy to get up, uh, get a database up and running um, pretty quickly and to uh, like write functions to create, update, and read what information is in that database. And so this is a React app. Um, I'm assuming most of you are hopefully somewhat familiar with at least JavaScript. Um, the way that a React app works is you declare a constant app and you return a bunch of HTML code. It's actually JSS, JSX code that will define what you want um, in the application. Uh, so what you want to render. And one nice thing about JSX is it allows you to kind of mix HTML with JavaScript code. So we can see I have all of these functions stubbed out and I have them, uh, but we're gonna essentially fill them, um, but we can do that kind of in a mix between HTML and JavaScript. So it takes some time for Amplify to generate generate all of the commands and to push to the cloud. But one thing that's cool about uh, AWS profiles is when you push something uh, to the cloud, you can give uh, authentication keys to other developers that you're working with, and they can pull down the custom configuration uh, from that Amplify uh, CLI. And it allows you to very easily share kind of the connections to the databases. And all you need is essentially an API key that will give you access to um, the AWS resources that you've provisioned. It does take some time. So here's the app that I have built out. Um, let's talk about something called use state. So in every React app, uh, in an HTML app, there is uh, state variables that you need to maintain in order to understand uh, what like uh, things have been set up with the database and uh, kind of what the current state of your application is. And so in previous versions of React, it was very common to uh, write it in the in the form of a class uh, where you could use class var variables and instance variables to uh, contain and to update the state for whatever you were displaying on the front end. Uh, but in later versions of React, it's much more common to write these things called functional components. And that's what this uh, declaration is right here. And what that is is considered a stateless component. Um, so it has to keep track of a lot less uh, like state uh, for lack of a better term, and uh, it allows it to more quickly render on the front end and provide a much more seamless user experience. And so when React switched to functional components um, and got rid of state, they needed a way to still maintain variables in the React application, and they did this by writing something called hooks. And so use state is one of those hooks. It's essentially a function that will allow you to declare a variable form state and an updater method set form state um, starting with an initial state. And so what, what I'm doing here is I'm saying, uh, let's have uh, a form and our form will be representational of this form input here. Um, we're taking in an input name, description and city. And we're gonna set those values to initially just be null values. And so as we update this form in the restaurants form, we're gonna use set form state to update the actual state variables that we're maintaining. The other thing that we wanna keep is a list of restaurants. So we're again gonna use state, this time initializing it with an empty list uh, to maintain a variable called restaurants. And we're gonna use a setter function called set restaurants to update that. 
um, when we do it. And the last hook that we use in this code is called use effect. And use effect essentially works by doing some function that you define uh, when something happens. And the when something happens is defined as what's put after this um, curly brackets. And you can put a variable here, which will say, if I put restaurants here, this use effect function will get called every single time the restaurants variable gets updated. And so if you put nothing here, it gets called on the first time the component renders and um, when basically when the component mounts into the front screen. And so that's what we're going to be doing with the use effect hook. For some reason, my GraphQL schema didn't generate properly in here. Oh, there it is. So this should render to basically an empty file. Okay, perfect. Um, now I can talk through all of these while actually adding to it. So we have an empty list of a restaurant and we have uh, this form input here. And when we type something into the, the form input, as I was saying, we want to actually change the input um, so that when we click the add new restaurant button, we can send that back to the database and handle the changes there. And so in this form specifically, I've stubbed out a function called handle change and handle change is going to take some event E and we're going to need to do something with that event. And So we can start by logging E just to see what happens when we change something here. And we'll, we'll look at the console in the Chrome developer window. And if I start typing, we can see that this event um, is returning something changed there. So in the description, uh, it'll also return the change there. And so what we wanna do is use the state that we had earlier, um, which I've stubbed out and need to put back in. We want to update this state that we used earlier. And so we'll do that by using our setter function and updating the form state. So this is a, a notation in React with the three dots where it takes the previous value of the form state and it takes your new updated value in the object and um, and sets it. So we get the previous form state and we wanna update what's in e.target.name, which is just the way that it's handled in this form. And we're gonna set it to e.target.value. And so when one of these boxes in our form changes, um, the respective name description or city in the form state will be up updated there. Cool. So now that we have the form input chain, we want to um, basically enable the functionality for the add a restaurant button. And so the add a, the add a restaurant button down here has an on click uh, method with create new restaurant, which we're going to work on now. And that will allow us to, uh, when we click the button, actually send all of the information back to the database. And so in React, the way that that works looks like this. First, we're going to want to check uh, if our form state is null. So we can add a couple of null checks up here if the city and description are not filled out, or maybe the name as well. Then we can return. Otherwise, we're going to want to get the name, the description, and the city from the form state. We're going to want to create a model of a restaurant. And this model is going to follow the schema that I was talking about earlier in GraphQL. So we're going to have a name, description, and city. And our variables are very handily named. So we can just put in the name, description, and the city into that model. 
And now the way that we upload this using AWS's API is we're going to await on the function because it's asynchronous. Um, we're going to use the API package from Amplify and use the GraphQL method to do an operation. And that GraphQL operation is going to be the create restaurant operation. I uh, will show you what this corresponds to in a second. So when we generated all of that uh, like functionality on GraphQL from the CLI that AWS has, it generated all of these files. I didn't open them, but I showed you the schema.graphql. Another thing that was generated are mutations, queries, and subscriptions for those GraphQL objects. So if we look in uh, mutations, we'll see that we have a create restaurant function, we have an update restaurant function, and we have a delete restaurant function. Um, GraphQL just calls the mutations because they're updating or changing objects. And so we use that function, in this case, specifically the create restaurant function um, in our GraphQL API to set the restaurant that we had. And so it takes a variable input and we're gonna give it a restaurant there. And then when we do that, um, we're gonna want to allow us to kind of reset the form state. So I'm just gonna write a function here that will set the form state back to the initial state. And the initial state was just the, the empty strings that we've defined up there. So now when we click the button, create new restaurant, it's gonna create a restaurant object and it's gonna use the GraphQL API, API to send that to the database that we have configured in the backend. So let's see if we can get that to work. So we can see here, um, now that all of the processing went through, I have two restaurant databases um, or two restaurant tables in the database. And I don't actually know which one's which, but we're about to find out. So if I type something here, click add new restaurant. Now we can go to the table in here and we should see it uploaded in the item. So there we go, restaurant, city, SF, description, description, name, test. Awesome, but nothing's updated on the front end here. And that's because we haven't listed out all of the restaurants. So in order to do that, we're gonna use our GraphQL API to query the restaurants. And so if we look at our queries, we can see that there's a function called get restaurants and there's a function called list restaurants. Pretty self-explanatory, the list restaurants is the one that we want. Um, the code that I've stubbed out will already handle displaying all the restaurants in this list as long as I give it uh, a proper list of restaurants. So what we need to do is we need to fetch for that list of restaurants. So we're gonna do that in this fetch restaurants um, method. And that's gonna look very similar to the create restaurants method. In this case, we're going to say const restaurant data gets await api.graphql and in this case we're using graphql operation of this restaurants yep so that'll give us all the restaurant data then we want to get the list of restaurants from that data and we'll do that by saying const restaurants gets If you're ever coding this and don't know what format this would be returned to you and how to actually access the items that you want, you can always just console log, which is what I did earlier to set this up. And we're gonna use our setter method to set the list of restaurants that we just returned. Awesome. And it's good practice to put this in a try catch loop just so if something does go wrong, we can log it and we can catch the error. So we'll catch the error here and we'll console log error fetching restaurants. Now we need to call this fetch restaurants method somewhere. And we wanna call that anytime the screen gets rendered or anytime the restaurants item gets updated. And so we'll go back to this use effect hook that I was talking about earlier. Because we're passing in an empty array here, Every time the component component mounts, or every time this web page gets reloaded or gets shown to the user, this use effect function will get called. And so we can 
use that to our advantage and call the fetch restaurants method um, when the page loads. And so now if I refresh the page, we should see that first restaurant um, pop up in this list because we have this use effect here. Beautiful. So we've fetched the information from the database and we've displayed it on the front end right here. Now, one of the th another thing that Graph uh, QL offers is subscriptions. And so in this file, you can see there are subscriptions to on create restaurant, on update restaurant, and on delete restaurant. And so what a subscription is, is subscribing to a data model and subscribing to changes on that data model. And so if we create a subscription to any time a restaurant is created, and we create that subscription when the page is loaded, then that subscription will auto update the page anytime something gets added and prevent us from having to continually reload the page. So that's what we're, we're going to add here. We're going to say const subscription, use the GraphQL API again. And this is going to take the, um, the on create operation. And instead of querying it, we're going to subscribe to it. And so the subscribe will take a value called next. And that next will return a function. And this function, uh, we can name the variable anything that we want. Restaurant data is what I named it here, just for simplicity's sake. But that restaurant data is new data that's been queried when the subscription gets notified that there's been a change. And so within this subscription method, we're going to say we want to take the new data that we've just received, and we're going to set the list of restaurants to be updated to that data so that we can auto update our list anytime something changes on the back end. Um, and so AWS will very nicely send out uh, all of the information if someone changes it from, say, another side of the website or like uh, the other side of the world. I mean, uh, you having a subscription on the website to listen for that change will allow you to auto update that list. And so in here, we're going to get all of the data that we want. From the restaurant data. And that's going to be given to us. Yeah, that accessor. We're going to declare a restaurant object the same way we did earlier with that data. And then we're going to use our setter function to update the list of restaurants. So what I'm doing here is kind of an interesting uh, React syntax where Instead of just setting restaurants to the list of restaurants, we are going to take the previous list, previous variable restaurants, and we're going to take all of the values from it, and then we're going to basically replace it with this new restaurant that's been added. Um, and that's because if we simply set restaurants to the restaurants variable, um, we would want the use effect hook to also watch for changes on that variable. So that's kind of a niche. A uh, React specific thing that we don't need to really dive into. But now that this is updated, um, anytime something gets posted, our code should automatically detect that it's been updated and it should load without having to refresh the page. So that's what you saw right there. So, in terms of all of the operations that we can do on GraphQL endpoints, we can create, we can read, we can update, and we can delete. And so, we've done the first two. Um, I won't do update in this talk, but we can go through delete. And so I've provided a nice button here that will allow us to delete this field when we actually build out the functionality. So let's do that. And that's going to call this handle delete function. So if we look down at the delete button, we can see that there's a method that says on click, run this function, handle delete, and it's going to take the restaurant ID for that specific row. And so with that knowledge, we can write the handle delete function. It's going to give us the restaurant ID in this event. E, and we can use that to delete the proper or the corresponding uh, restaurant from the database.
we'll create a restaurant object. And in order to delete, all you have to define in an object is the ID. Um, and since we passed in the ID as E, we can just set the ID there. Then we'll call the delete restaurant GraphQL operation. And we'll pass in our input of this restaurant object, object that we just created. Then we're going to do something more. Um, this will allow us to delete from the website. But because we only subscribe to changes for a restaurant on creation, um, we want to make sure that the view gets rendered anytime, or get the view, the list of restaurants gets updated anytime we see a deletion of a restaurant as well. And so there's a few ways that we could do this. Um, one way is we can know that internally we have a state of a list of restaurants. And so if from the front end we delete it uh, using all of this, I could say delete it from the database and then manually go into this list of restaurants that we have saved as a variable and remove the, the line that we have. Um, and that'll trigger a re-render in React because uh, it's a state variable and anytime a state variable gets updated, um, React will re-render. Um, another way that we can do it is simply by re-querying the list. Um, I think that's the easiest way to do it. So that's what I'm going to do right here, where once we've deleted the, the method, we're going to recall this method fetch restaurants um, to get the new updated list of restaurants from the cloud. So I'm saying once we do this function, then we call this new function. Um, and the syntax here is just basic JavaScript, JavaScript syntax uh, for a promise that'll resolve as soon as the first um, method completes. And so this will allow us to requery the um, new restaurant list once this has been deleted from the cloud. And I have a syntax error. We love this. How about we just do this? Cool. So when this reloads, we can make sure that our delete button works. While that's loading, I might talk about some of the other things that Amplify CLI offers. So we've added connection to a database, but you can do a lot more than that. You can also add um, authentication for your React app. So many times websites will want you to require a login or will require you to log in before being able to use the website. And the way that Amazon provides authentication capabilities is through something called Amazon Cognito. That's their uh, user authentication service. And so within Amplify, we can simply run Amplify add auth, and that'll allow us to configure the default, the configuration for um, identification verification. And so we'll just use the default um, settings here, and we'll let that run. And while that's running, we can go back here and see if our delete button worked. So restaurant description city, so we can add one. And if we press delete, it should get removed from the list. And there you go. Um, it has been re removed from the list. And if we go into our DynamoDB instance and we click on items, we can see that the only one remaining is the one that's left in the list. Cool. So now we'll run Amplify Push to push the authentication changes up to the cloud so that we can actually use those and integrate them into our app. And that will take a couple minutes. And so while we are doing that, what left do we have? What else do we have left? Um, ah, yes. Um, so the last thing that we'll build into this app is another type of storage, specifically S3 storage. So DynamoDB works very well with text-based inputs, but it doesn't allow for storage of images and videos. And that's what uh, Amazon or AWS S3 is used for. And S3, um, hopefully most of you are somewhat familiar with it. It's basically just a lot of buckets and the buckets contain information 
and data that you supply them. So they're basically just big uh, areas, containers where you can drop files, you can drop uh, whatever you want pretty much um, to be hosted. And so Amplify also offers a very nice um, JavaScript functions to interact with those, which we can set up as, as soon as this renders. Um, yeah, it'll take a minute. Bear with us. Does anyone have any questions so far? Hopefully this is all making sense and is somewhat relevant. You're doing great, Joey. Thanks, Mark. Here's a documentation for Amplify. Um, I learned it earlier this summer, and since then, the documentation has gotten so much better. So it's super helpful to learn whatever you need to do. Um, it will go into a lot more detail on GraphQL. It'll go into a lot more detail on uh, how to customize way more configurations, um, how to build out uh, just about anything that you want to do with your website, you can subscribe to other types of messages from a provider with any API uh, service provider. You can configure push notifications with your application. Um, and they even have some server-side rendering that you can uh, customize. I was looking into server-side rendering last night and earlier I'm not sure if you've covered it in this class. Uh, maybe some more you can mention if you have, but what server-side rendering is, is essentially allowing the server to, before it sends all of the information to the client, so the client knows what to render on the, the website, website um, you can pre-render some of that content and that'll allow the client to render it much more quickly. And so instead of serving like JavaScript, JavaScript code that the client then has to run to figure out state, and generate an HTML tree of what to display on the client. Um, you can pre-run that JavaScript code on the server and just uh, send the HTML tree to the client um, already rendered so that all it has to do is display the HTML code. And so that's kind of a more advanced technique that'll allow uh, faster websites to load, um, specifically with like dynamic websites, and you can um, use those. Cool, so this finished uploading and to show you what it did, we're going to go to the AWS console and go into Cognito. So as I was mentioning, Cognito is Amazon's like identity and verification um, tool. And it's very configurable. So all of these things here, if you're unfamiliar, are different, basically server hostings of Amazon. And whatever project you're working on within them has to be dedicated to a specific kind of region of the United States or around the world. And so if you're not in the proper uh, region, you, can't, you won't see your actual work. Um, so here's the, the workshop user pool that we just created. You can see that you can customize um, all of the login information that you could possibly want. You can change up your required attributes. You can um, say whether or not username uh, is required, whether it's case sensitive, your password policies, uh, et cetera. I'll let you all look into that kind of more in your turn, but that's what we're gonna be working with uh, when we do this. And so in order to add that into our React application, and before I do that, I'm gonna let this run in the background because it's also gonna take some time. We're going to amplify add storage in order to allow us to add the images into the S3 buckets. We want users and guests to do that. So what we did here is we provided a name for the bucket. We said that guest users and authentication users can have access 
and they'll have access to be able to create things in S3 buckets, update them, read them, delete them, etc. Now we're going to push that to the cloud again, and I will go back to talking about authentication because that'll take a while to run. So the way that you have to add authentication to an app in Amplify uh, is super simple. You can literally just wrap the entire tree that you're returning in the render method with this thing called Amplify Authenticator. And so if you put this around your entire application, and we also want to include a sign out button, you can see now that in order to use the application, we have to be signed in. Um, so AWS provides a lot of customization with this authentication, me authentication method. So you can write out your actual like sign in function functions if you want. You can change the attributes of what an account is created. You can change when this gets displayed and when is required. Um, but at a base level, wrapping the entire um, tree with the component of the Amplify Authenticator will give this very generic sign-in screen. Um, we can create an account like that, which will allow us to sign in. Um, I guess their default method is having someone uh, confirm their email. So I just got an email, 421292 is the code, and that will allow us to sign in. And now that we're signed in, uh, we've rendered down here a simple sign out button. And that's why this is being rendered. So we can customize all of that. But that's how you add uh, authentication into your web application. Uh, very, very easy. Cool. So the last thing that I'll cover is adding and displaying images um, through this CLI. Uh, here we can see that, oh no, I actually didn't sub it out earlier. In order to do that, we're going to have to add an image header or an image column, I mean. So there is the image column. And in the image column, we're going to want to display the image. Let's put the image column on top of the delete. And then in order to display it, we're going to render, I'm just going to copy this code so it's quicker. We're going to render an image with the source of a restaurant image. Now, if we're listing just the restaurant itself, that's going to be coming from this GraphQL schema. And so in order to attach an image to a GraphQL schema, we're going to want to define the URL for that image. So let's give it an attribute called image and say that it's a string. Uh, in this case, let's say that it's not required. So we can upload uh, an object to the database without having an image URL in case we don't want to upload an image with that specific object. Um, once we change this GraphQL schema, we'll have to repush to Amplify, which will take a while. Um, but we can start writing out the other functions. And so, In order to both query and display and upload an image, we're going to use the JavaScript functions that Amplify provides. In this case, that's going to look like a method that basically says storage.put. And so we're going to input import storage uh, from the AWS package up here, and that's going to give us an object that we can work with to create a restaurant. So in our code in create new restaurant, that's where we're going to be displaying, or that's where we're going to be uploading an image. Um, image style is not defined. Uh, let's define it. run amplify status and this will basically check 
if we've changed anything in our local configuration that we need to push. And so this should tell us that we need to update the API because we changed the GraphQL schema. So this is really nice because it handles everything for you. So we can now amplify push to get those changes to be pushed up to the cloud. And so in the create restaurant uh, method, we're gonna wanna upload our image based on uh, an image tag. Let's write some code that'll allow us to handle an image. So we can add an input in JavaScript and we can add that underneath this form. And this input will be a type file and it will accept PNG images. And we need to write a method that will allow us to handle a file change. So every time Now we have a file uploader option here where we can upload a file. And anytime we upload a file, we wanna handle the change of that file and we wanna actually um, set it to a state. So let's go up here and let's in our state declare another variable called file. Um, we can set that initially to null and <clears throat> we can update that as is necessary. So in our update file change or handle file change method, we're going to want to update changing that file. And so the specific syntax is going to look like using our set form state method, get our previous form state values. And we're going to take the event or the change of the file and we're going to get the target name. And we're going to set that to, oops, no, that's what we did earlier. We're going to get the file from that and we're gonna set it to a variable named file. So we will do that. And that will set the state of the file anytime we choose a file. Now in order to upload it, we'll do that in our create new restaurant um, function. What we're gonna wanna do first is upload the file to AWS, then we'll get a URL from the S3 bucket that we can use to add to uh, this specific restaurant model in our database. And then we can use that URL to basically pull down the image from the S3 bucket and display it in this specific box um, right here. So up here, we can say if the form state file is not null, then we're going to want to upload the file. So we use that storage package or component that we imported earlier. And we're gonna put something into the storage. And so we're gonna put the actual file. Um, let's put the file name and let's put the file. And then we're gonna set the content type to be a PNG. Cool, so this will put this file with this name into our S3 bucket, and we'll let S3 know that it's an image, uh, specifically a PNG, and so that'll just allow it to uh, be rendered more easily. And once we have that uploaded into the S3 bucket, we're gonna want to get the results of, or get the, yeah, the result that's returned um, from this successful put, and then get the actual URL um, to the object in the file and then upload that into our GraphQL function. So here, let's say image URL, and we're going to wait storage get dot key. And so this result re will return uh, a file name once it's successfully put in. And in order to get a predefined URL that will allow anyone to render the image, we can use storage.get. So that's what we're doing here. Then we can declare our restaurant with a name description URL. Uh, in order to do that, we're going to move these above. And then we're going to use our GraphQL API function. to 
create a restaurant and put that restaurant that we just added into the into the database. Then as we did earlier, we're gonna want to update or just reset the form state to the initial state so we can add more files later. Cool, and so that's if it does have a file. If it doesn't have a file, well, then we can just do what we were doing earlier and set the restaurant as it is. So now, if we add a name, a description, a city, and we add some image file, hmm, we'll see, we get an error. What does the error say? The variables input contains a field name that doesn't exist. And that is because this hasn't been pushed. <laughs> So once that gets pushed to the AWS backend, um, we'll be able to query or run this graph GraphQL, uh, not a query, I guess it's a, a create um, method. And then we won't be seeing that error anymore and it will allow us to render the image. And that is pretty much the entirety of the basis of this app. So we can finish that off when it finishes loading, but. Does anyone have any questions on what we've covered so far? It can be a question about React, about AWS, um, if I went too quickly on, on something. I'm also happy to talk about other ways to host websites. Um, I mentioned CloudFront distributions earlier. Uh, those can be pretty interesting um, as to how they work and with respect to load balancing. Joey, we have a question in the chat. Um, what is the const uh, name description city equals from state notation? So I guess you can just talk about destructuring maybe. Mm. Yes. Let's find a line where it says that. Uh -huh. um, so form state is gonna be an object and we've defined it as an object within React to have these characteristics. It's gonna have a, a name attribute, a descri description attribute, a city attribute, and a file attribute. And our initial state is basically saying that all of those attributes are these initial values. And so in React, we can do something cool where we where we basically declare four or three variables at the same time by getting their corresponding variable from that object. So this will um, reference the name, the description, and the city um, like sub objects or uh, attributes within that state, within the form state, and it will set it to these variables, name, description, and city. So this would be the same as if I said, um, const name gets form state dot name, and then const city gets that dot city, and so on. Um, what's the difference between that notation and the um, one that you have right below, like line 25? Here. So the use state is a hook in React. And as I was talking about earlier, hooks are basically custom functions that React has provided in order to get around certain functionality that they removed when removing or not removing when switching from class components to functional components. And so use state is a specific method that React provides that will return uh, two like items. And those two items uh, are returned in an array. And the first one will be a variable and the second one will be a setter variable or a setter method. And so in like um, Java, for example, within a class, you can have instance variables and let's say that we have a class chicken and one of the instance variables is like uh, weight. And so you have an attribute for the object of the chicken that has weight and you might also have a get weight or a set weight method 
if you want to update the weight of that chicken. Say the chicken loses 10 pounds and you want to uh, update that object in your database or whatever, you can set the weight to update that method, or sorry, to update that variable. And that's what this is doing here. So it's just a clean notation of saying, um, we're declaring a variable restaurants and we're declaring a method set restaurants um, to update that variable restaurants. And then what you pass into use state uh, is the initial value. So in our set form state, which is what handles all of the changes in this form submission, um, that uh, uses its initial state that I declared. And then in uh, the restaurants, since restaurants is just a list of restaurants, or that at least that's how we handle it in this function, we're passing it an empty list. And so if I wanted to use a variable that was like const name and set name, also you can name these whatever you want. Like I could call this y and it would just be a method y that doesn't really make sense. It's a set name makes a lot more sense. You could use use state uh, to be an initial value of Joey. And then if I wanted to change that, I could say set name uh, Samarth and that would change the variable name to be Samarth. It looks like this pushed to AWS. So let's see if we're able to upload and render images. What's a good restaurant in Berkeley? Oh, it's Strata. I guess that's not a restaurant, but I don't have, oops, I don't have a picture of Strata, but, oh, well, that's an interesting bug. Somewhere we have a race condition where, I don't know why it did that, but it loaded um, a lot of variables into the restaurant lists. Um, we don't need to debug that. That was probably just a transient error. But there you go. Now that we've um, imported the storage, we can see that there's the image that we uploaded. And so if we go into the AWS uh, console and we go to our S3 buckets, we can check out all of the actual information that we have stored there. Um, this one is one of these guys. This one, maybe? Maybe not. Maybe it's this one. One of these buckets contains that image. You get the idea. I don't know which one. This one. There we go. So it has a public folder. Um, that's because the image that we uploaded um, was set to public. And there are the images that we uploaded. So one thing that we didn't do was write the delete functionality to delete from S3 when we delete a row um, in this table. But that can be done in a very similar way to the way that we got the image using storage.get. So storage has an, another uh, function called delete where you could write storage.delete and then use the item key to delete from that bucket in S3. Happy to answer any more questions either about React or AWS or my time or my role at Facebook if anyone's curious. On the topic of Facebook, do you have any tips for like recruiting and like recruiting preparation and stuff like that? You know, juicy details. Yeah. Um, when I was recruiting for internships in sophomore and junior year of, at Berkeley, I relied on cracking the coding interview all, all day, every day, pretty much, uh, that and leak code. I think that there are two kind of hard part, parts of recruiting. One is first actually getting your foot in the door, talking to a recruiter or getting an interview with a company. And the second is once you have that interview, doing well in the interview and, and prepping for it. So on the first part, um, in order to actually get the interview, I, I applied to 
dozens and dozens, if not hundreds of jobs, um, and basically tried to use connections at any company that I had to um, be able to talk with engineers that work there and see what job op openings there were. So I would say on that route, some tips are definitely utilize your networks. If you know people working at companies, ask them for referrals. Um, if you don't know people working at companies, cold email or cold message on LinkedIn to try to get your foot in the door. Um, do your research on the company and see what it is or what role you might be specifically interested in. And if you are sending a cold email, explain those specific interests saying, hi, I'm, this is who I am and this is what I'm looking for. And this is why I'm interested in this position. Um, you'll probably get a lot of rejections and that's okay because if you continue like on that process, there's enough jobs for all of us, hopefully, that uh, if you persevere, you'll eventually, eventually get one. So don't be discouraged by that. I had dozens and dozens of, of rejections. On the note of doing well in an actual interview, the things that helped me specifically were lead code and cracking the coding interview and doing a lot of practice problems. It also helped to sit down with a friend and go through um, like practice interviews and have uh, him and her like actually question me as if I was in the interview to practice whiteboarding, to practice talking through my thought process and to practice talking um, as if I was responding to a question in, in an interview. Dope, thanks. Of course. Does anyone else have any questions? Uh, just really quickly, um, if you are leaving or have to leave or when you do eventually leave, uh, it'd be great if you took a moment to fill out the feedback form. It's currently in the chat. And yeah, as for questions, maybe Joey, do you wanna talk about how being a software engineer in the industry is maybe different from it, like, academic CS, like what you do in class or just how it is in the industry? Uh, sure. I think the biggest difference is the quantity of code. And so when I started at Facebook and started working on a project, instead of like a couple hundred, maybe a couple thousand lines of code that was in the biggest project I did at Cal, which would probably be operating systems. Instead of that, I now have millions of lines of code to read through. And at least at Facebook, there's an expectation that you're going to be pretty independent and able to like problem solve and find out answers on your own, uh, or at least that you attempt to before going and asking for help. And so one of the biggest challenges is knowing even where to look. Um, there's a lot of internal tools and documentation that you can read to scrounge that like through that code. Uh, but that was definitely one of the biggest changes from my time at Berkeley uh, was just the, the scale at which uh, we operate. And I don't think that's unique to Facebook. It might be unique to like large companies in general. Um, but that was one thing that I saw from talking to a couple of my other friends who are also software engineers at various companies. I think that there's a lot of platforms that companies use such as AWS that aren't taught in school. And so it's awesome that you are all like trying to learn these now because AWS is something that many startups, many even large scale companies uh, use internally. And so understanding how those corporate tools work is going to give you definitely an edge when going to work for one of those companies. Um, and so learning more than just the basics of syntax of different languages and kind of how like an operating system works or how computer security works, I think understanding some of those industry uh, tools is a good way to get an edge, but there's so many out there that it's very daunting to learn. Docker is another one of those tools. If anyone is curious and wants to go uh, learn about it, that's basically containerized services. Um, you can also host websites using Docker, um, which is cool if you write like a, a Node.js or sorry, like an express server um, and you want to containerize it, you can basically upload a Docker container with all of your functionality to, um, I think Elastic Beanstalk is the service that AWS allows you to use it with. And you can write your build scripts that'll uh, kind of render the server based on 
what your container is defined as. Um, and that's a pretty neat way to provide more functionality um, on the back end of a website. Awesome. Thanks, Joey. Is there any more questions? Yeah. If, and if there's not, I'm happy. Feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn or Facebook or uh, my email is just JP and then my last name uh, at berkeley.edu. Feel free to send me a message or ask somewhere to be put in touch. I'm always happy to talk um, if you ever need help with anything or ever have any questions about this. Um, hopefully this talk was somewhat helpful to all of you. I think that React is a really cool language and I like how easy AWS has made it to inter integrate with it. Um, I only covered Amplify and AWS today, but as I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, Google Firebase is very similar. And so if you decide um, at some point when you're making a website that you wanna use Google tools, maybe that's because they provide a better pricing platform for specifically what you're looking at. Um, a lot of it will probably look very similar where they have like a JavaScript uh, framework that allows you to integrate with their tooling as well. Um, so that's something to check out. Yeah, feel free to contact me. And I don't know if anyone has any, has any questions now. If not, we can, we can head out. Thank you. Thank you all for listening. Thank you. All right, sick. Let me stop recording.